While the debate rages on about what to cancel and what activities to restrict in horse world during this outbreak, you might be left wondering, what is this virus? What does it do exactly? Why is it so dangerous and yet not? And a lot of the conversation are at the level of awareness and recommendation, specific symptoms and treatment, and those are absolutely needed. But I wanted to talk specifically about the virus itself, how it hurts our horse, in order to bring some deeper understanding of all this information, and hopefully help you make better decisions when it comes to your horse. For a long time, owners and veterinarians have known that horses were prone to what looks a lot like the cold and flu in humans, without knowing exactly what path causes it. They needed to name it something, so they went with equine viral rhino pneumonitis to describe what it was, and so it was commonly called rhino. It's still called that, actually. When the virus was finally identified, it turned out to be one from a very well-known family of viruses. It's one that us, humans, have been dealing for eons. We actually deal with at least three different versions of it. It's a virus that has been around mammals in general for a very long time, and it has evolved to take various forms adapted to each species. The one we are the most familiar with in humans are called simplex, zoster, and Epstein-Barr. In fact, herpes virus are so ubiquitous that experts are confident that we all carry some of them in us. It's latent and dormant in most of us for most of our life, but as we will see, it doesn't mean that they're harmless. Equines have their own, simply called equine herpes virus 1 all the way through 5, although there's probably a few more out there, but these are the most common. Of these, number 1 and 4 are the most concerning when it comes to widespread outbreaks. Similarly as with human, they're endemic to the horse population. That means it's widespread in the population. Actually, estimates put it at about 80% of the horse population having been exposed to it at some point. So how do we know this for either horses or human, for that matter? Well, whenever a human or a horse has been exposed to it at any point in its life, it will have antibodies for it in its blood. Now, it doesn't mean that the immune system is necessarily able to fight it off. Having antibodies does not guarantee a fail-proof response to it if it comes back. We will get back to that point just a little bit later on. The immune system and how it works is one of the most complex systems in biology. Anyone telling you anything else is selling you something. Herpes virus in general are master of disguise and superb infiltrators. They are able to evade the immune system in their host by laying low and being very, very quiet for a long period of time, and then flare up at a moment's notice when the immune system is weakened in order to reproduce and shed their viral copies so that they can spread out. I will remind you, or tell you, just in case you don't know, that viruses are very simple organisms that need to hijack other cells in order to reproduce. They need to take over host body cell to do this, and in doing so, they destroy them, and that is generally what causes the sickness in the host. Also, Generally speaking, viruses that are too flashy and active and deadly, those that adopt a scorched earth approach, will die out quickly, killing their host and limiting their own spread. Herpes virus, on the other hand, have been with mammal for millions of years. They know how to play the long-term game. In humans, for example, if you've had chicken pox as a child, you're at risk of developing shingles later in life. It's the same virus. It's been sitting quietly in your body for decades and decades, and then suddenly can be reactivated. One more thing to know about herpes virus in general, before we get into details about the equine herpes, herpes virus, is that they are specialists of epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are type of cells that make, well, epithelial tissues, which cover the surface of organs. They make up the veins and the arteries. They're also lining the body cavities, and of course, it's found outside of it. The skin is one giant epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissues, those are the cells that the herpes viruses target to reproduce. Now, it takes a lot of fancy footwork for a virus to be able to infect a particular set of cells because, you see, each me cell membrane is a little bit different from one type of cell to the other. So it makes sense that they have evolved into each of them into a little bit of a niche. And that is where the crucial difference lies between our two equine herpes viruses, the EHV1 and the EHV4. 
EHV4 has an affinity for the epithelial cell of the respiratory tract. And so that is the strain that generally causes runny nose, coughing, and the respiratory disease. EHV1 is more versatile. And while it can use the respiratory tract to reproduce, if it can get access to the epithelial tissue of the vascular system, that's all the circulatory system, think of veins, arteries, and capillaries, it is much happier there. So let's take a moment to understand the implication. EHV4 will attack and use the lining of the respiratory tract during an active infection. Thankfully, that is a part of the body that is robustly able to handle pathogens since it's regularly exposed to them. EHV1 will do the same, but if it gets a chance to penetrate into the blood, it will be able to cause much more damage, and it will randomly use whatever epithelial cell tissue along its path to reproduce. It will cause, or it can cause rather, vasculitis. That's an inflammation of the veins. It can cause thrombosis, so blood clots, internal hemorrhages, and if it reaches the capillaries that surround the spinal cord and the brain, well, that is when you'll have horses showing neurological symptom that I'm sure you've heard about. Also, extra information for those of you with broodmares. If it reaches the vascular system of the placenta nourishing the fetus, it will cause enough damage to cause an abortion. It can also kill the fetus by inflicting the same damage to it once it has passed into its system via the blood. Now, let's talk about how horses can have this virus for years or decades and then suddenly become sick and what that means for understanding of outbreaks. If you're still with me, thank you. That means you're interested in the practical, scientific aspect of raising horses. Uh, well, you're in the right place because that's pretty much all I talk about. Thank you to my channel member and Patreon member for the support. And if you, the link is down in the description if you'd like to join them and get some extra perks. Okay, so what causes outbreaks like the one in North America in 2011 and in the fall of 2025? Herpes virus are so ubiquitous that they're considered endemic, like we said, meaning that it's present at all time in the population, and pretty much every horse carries it. They get the initial infection as young horses, sometimes even as fools. Initially, it goes well and they fight it off. Remember, the virus does not seek to kill its host. It just needs it to reproduce and shed more viral particle so that it can spread. After this initial infection, the virus goes dormant. It's never completely eliminated because part of its infection profile is to find a place to hide during or right after that initial infection. During this latency period, nothing happens. The virus is not shed, the horse is not sick. In fact, the horse looks completely normal. The virus will sit latent in either the ganglia or the lymph nodes, biding its time until a stressor comes along and puts a spanner in that nicely balanced coexistence. Now, while not sentient per se, the virus probably makes regular attempt to leave its hiding place in order to reproduce, but if the immune system is vigilant and robust, it doesn't make it very far. However, comes a time when the horse is stressed, for whatever reason. Any kind of stress has the potential to release corticosteroids that suppress the immune system, and that is the opportunity the virus was ready for. This time, when the virus leaves its hiding place in the lymph node or the ganglia, it can make its way to the nasal cavity unchallenged. And there, it will start to settle in the epithelial cell lining the nose and reproduce. Doing so will create inflammation and little open sores. It'll irritate the horse. The coughing will start. The inflammation creates pus and the nose discharge appears. All this, of course, is loaded with viral particle being shed, of course, so that they can go on and reach another host. Now, it's got to be quick, however. The herpes virus is not very resistant to being out in the world on its own. It's a risk to spread this way because it could die be before it finds a warm spot, basically. That is why limiting nose-to-nose -nose contact and direct contact and proximity between horse is an effective way of controlling an outbreak and why shipping horses or stressing them by taking them away from their routine is a great way to promote one. Once those viral particles find their way into another animal, the infection is re-triggered. Even if the horse has been exposed to it before and the immune system should have a good way to identify this virus returning for another attack, it turns out that 
Not all horses can do that, and some will become sick again, while other will just have a mild form of it. That part is really out of our, anyone's control. It can be very random how each horse will react to either this reinfection from within or if it comes from another horse. And that randomness, that unpredictability, is exactly what makes people complacent. Now, if you're lucky in your unluckiness and your horse uh, gets infected with either EHV1 and 4, but it's limited to respiratory tract, be aware that those can also lead to complication, usually in the form of secondary bacterial infection that can knock the, the immune system even further, leading to some worsening of their condition. However, there is a chance that something far worse will happen. If the virus is EHV1, and through a sore that it created itself by damaging the epithelial layer, it gets access to the blood, it will now have access to the entire circulatory system, a system made of the very tissue it is best suited to invade and hijack for its reproduction. It will have the ability to inflict damage on any organ, and it will reach every little capillary, including those that feed the brain, and the spinal cord. And when that happens, blood flow is compromised. The neural tissue gets progressively starved for oxygen and dies. That is why some horses get neurological symptoms. All right, now on to the topic of vaccination. Let's not forget that vaccines trains your horse's immune system to fight a specific virus. It gives it the information it needs to recognize it so it can attack it and eliminate it. The freshest the immune system's memory is, the best chance you have of giving that immune system a chance to recognize and attack the virus. But EHV viruses, through luck, or more, more likely through evolution, have become very unmemorable to the system. Remember that this whole family of virus has made it its modus operandi to hide within its host for years. What that means is that the herpes viruses are very good at hiding and disguising themselves to evade the immune system. For example, when it comes to vaccinating mare against EVH1, we need to vaccinate every two to three months during the placental phase of the pregnancy in order to reduce the chance of them aborting if they ever are exposed to the virus or if stress re-triggers an awakening of the virus within their own body. That is how often the immune system needs to be reminded for maximum protection. Yes, I am using easier to understand language here that you might find in some specialized paper, but I hope you get the gist of it. And if you do want those references that are written in a scientific way, you can go to my Patreon page and I'll have a document there with all that information. So for breeders, that is why simply having your mare in a closed herd is no guarantee that the enemy will not come from within the house if you want. And that is how all outbreaks start. One horse's virus becomes reactivated and it starts to be shed and by taking over the epithelial cell in the nose of the host horse and, in, and so on and so on. And before that horse is even showing much sign of being sick, it has the potential to infect and reinfect all the horses it has been in close proximity with. So while your horse might be fine, the next horse that gets this virus from yours might not be. And that is why during an active outbreak, when you don't know what horse has been exposed to what, if they are in the latent phase or in the actin phase, it's just best not to move horses around. Keep the ones you have as stress-free as you can and discuss with the veterinarian to see if they recommend boosting with a vaccine or not. And remember that while horses are very resilient as a whole population, the individual ones are not. Will the lucky one be yours or your friends?